Well, my dear friends, we live in a world where every single one of us is given different roles and responsibilities. And it is interesting in that even though we may be in the same location, um, not everyone has the same role. And take a school, for example, not everyone is a teacher. There are students and there is the principal as well and other workers. And it is the same with the workplace or in the family. And yes, with certain roles, there comes various privileges. And indeed, at times, uh, for example, in a shop, uh, we can spot the owner or the manager, someone who might not wear a work uniform, uh, someone who is, but that person is far beyond uh, simply a customer. And we can see by the privileges given to that person. And sometimes it is good, sometimes it's important for us to spot that, especially when we find ourselves in need of help. But my friends, how much more so we need to recognize the one through the pages of Scripture, the one who is not just a worshipper, but the one whom we are called to worship. For he is the one whom we desperately need for both provision and salvation. And do we know him? And so let us continue on in our series of studies in the Gospel of Matthew. And the sermon title for this morning is this. Provision through the fish's mouth. Provision through the fish's mouth. And by God's grace and with his help, we shall be considering verses 22 to 27 of chapter 17. And we shall do so under the four thoughts. Firstly, the presumption. Secondly, the portrayal. Thirdly, the payment. And fourthly and finally, the provision. Provision through the fish's mouth. The presumption, the portrayal, the payment. And finally, the provision. My dear friends, especially for those of us who have been studying through this series, may remember that the Lord Jesus has been showing his disciples again and again as to who he really is. Especially those three disciples, Peter, James and John. They were taken, remember, to that mountain of transfiguration where they were given a glimpse of the glory of Christ as the Lord Jesus was transfigured. But it didn't stop there. Even at the foot of the mountain, the Lord Jesus has shown forth his power and his grace as he is the one who is both willing and able to heal the demon-possessed son the boy, and indeed he has shown himself to be the one who grants faith, who saves the father of that boy from the spiritual disease of unbelief. Yes, the Lord Jesus has shown forth his glory not only on the mountain but also at the foot of the mountain. However, he doesn't want to linger at the foot of the mountain with his disciples. He must continue on in his earthly ministry. And his disciples must continue on in following him, in knowing more of him and what he is about to accomplish. And therefore, as they travel back to Galilee, the Lord Jesus is giving them the message, the prediction about himself. And we can read of that, of what he says to his disciples in the second half of verse 22 and the first half of 23. It says, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. My friends, as most of us would know, that this is not the first time that the Lord Jesus gives his disciples this particular prediction concerning his sufferings, death and resurrection. 
In fact, this is the third time that the Lord Jesus tells his disciples, and the previous two occasions are recorded in the previous chapter, chapter sixteen, verse twenty-one, and also in our chapter seventeen, verse twelve. And once again, we are brought to that realization, that important reminder of what the Lord Jesus is called to do on earth. The goal, the focus of his ministry is not on the mountain top or even the foot of the mountain of transfiguration, but the sufferings and the death awaiting him in Jerusalem. Friends, this is not the Lord Jesus forgetting that he has told the disciples before and thus repeating himself. No, it is rather the other way around, for he knows how forgetful his disciples can be. He knows how slow of heart they are. He wants his disciples to be absolutely sure um, as to why he has come to this earth and what uh, what he has to do. And dear disciples of the Lord Jesus, don't we need this? reminder as well. Isn't it true that the wider Christian church can be so confused about that even after 2,000 years? Some say that the Lord Jesus is simply a model, a fantastic example to learn from in terms of knowing how to love another fellow human being, how to be kind, how to be merciful, and he is seen as no more than a life coach. Others see his work and ministry, especially in his work of healing, the work of feeding the crowd, caring for the poor and the needy, as a call to be concerned about social justice, social welfare, and nothing more than that. And Christ is seen as no more than a social worker than the only saviour of sinners. And what about us? Do we get confused about by that? Do we see him, do we follow him as no more than an example, a life coach, no more than a social worker, or whatever? the world suggests to us, presenting to us basically this, whatever that is from the unbelieving world. They're presenting to us a Christless, crossless Christianity, which is no gospel at all. And indeed, do we have that grief do we, in our hearts when we find, when we hear that Christ is so wrongly thought of By the world of sinful ignorance. Well, here the disciples, they are rather grieved and sorrow. Not because of that, but because the Lord Jesus has repeated this message, this prediction. In their minds, they just don't understand why the Lord Jesus has to bring this up. In their minds, they they would be saying... Well, why couldn't he take us the twelve this time back up to that mountain of transfiguration or at the very least staying at the foot of the mountain, healing more people, casting out more demons? Why couldn't he do it? Why do we have to go? They want to see more of the ministerial success and they don't want to hear anything about the message of sufferings and impending death. And this is why they are sorrowful. And in Mark's account in chapter 9, we are told that they were afraid to ask the Lord Jesus more about that. They may perhaps think that, well, if they don't mention it, if they don't ask the Lord about it, that message will simply go away. However, that is never the intention of the Lord Jesus. In fact, he is going to show his disciples, especially Peter, as to who he really is. And yes, on the surface, we may not find any connection between the prediction of his suffering and death with the last section of this chapter. However, the Lord Jesus is teaching his disciples Something more than just paying some tax. 
And so let us look at our first point, the presumption, the presumption. And we can see that in verse 24, as it says, When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And friends, the word of God here take us back to that familiar place and city of Capernaum in Galilee. The Lord Jesus and his disciples, they have been away from this place for a long time. Remember, they had visited Tyre and Sidon, the region of Caesarea Philippi, and also um, the mountain of Transfiguration. But now, the Lord Jesus has taken the disciples back to Capernaum. And that is also where Peter lives, where his house is. And indeed, we're not told as to how long it has taken them to get to Capernaum. But there is no doubt that the disciples would be very quiet and sorrowful about the last message that the Lord Jesus gave. But at this point, something happens. Something happens. Peter is approached by a group of people. He's approached by some tax collectors. But these tax collectors, they are not the ex-colleagues of Matthew. For the tribute or the tax here is not the government tax to the Romans. It is rather a religious tax, a tribute that goes towards the temple in Jerusalem. And this is why in our text it is known as the temple tax. And at this time uh, of the passage in those days, it was a set amount. Our English translation doesn't convey it. It simply says tax or tribute money. But in the Greek, it is literally a didrachmon, a didrachmon, a specific coin. And the amount would be equivalent to an average worker's two days wages for his work. And indeed, this temple tax is not a new invention. It's not something new they thought of in those days. No, it dates all the way back to Exodus chapter 26. Even during the time when the children of Israel were instructed to build the tabernacle. And it was a tax that every adult uh, in Israel had to pay. Everyone had to uh, contribute to the building of the tabernacle. And this tax was reinstated during the time of Nehemiah towards the rebuilding of the second temple. But at this time, this temple tax is collected annually for the upkeep, for the maintenance of the building. And so it has been customary for any upright Jewish man in Israel to pay this voluntary temple tax. In other words, in those days, Paying the temple tax would be considered as a decent thing to do. It would be seen as a deed of religious fervency and national patriotism. And at this point, the temple tax collectors, they have come to Peter with a question, asking him, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Yes, they are not coming with a demand, but simply an inquiry as to whether the Lord Jesus would contribute to the temple. And it is interesting that they have not gone straight to the Lord Jesus, for in those days it is usual for people to approach the disciples first before the master or the teacher. But what is the response of Peter to the question about the Lord Jesus here. Well, rather than bringing that question back to the Lord Jesus, Peter, as he often does, has taken upon himself the role of the spokesperson. And he immediately answers in verse 25, Yes, yes. Dear friends, do we see what Peter is doing right now? He is acting on presumption. He is acting on impulse. 
He is so ready to speak for the Lord before he is ready to speak to the Lord first. He has done it thoughtlessly, and perhaps as we come to this point, we may find it quite puzzling. We may say, "Well, what is the big deal here? It seems so small a matter. Is it even worth mentioning that back to the Lord Jesus? Should Peter really trouble the Lord Jesus? It seems so trivial." My dear friends, yes, I agree. On the surface, it doesn't seem to be a big issue, but as we shall find out, it is so important for it touches the matter of who the Lord Jesus really is. Maybe we may wonder why Peter would be so ready to give such a response, and there is no doubt that in his mind Peter would give this answer without seriously thinking through the implications. In his mind, he thinks to himself, "Of course, of course, he would pay that tax. Jesus is an upright Jew and teacher. He would certainly pay that temple tax, just like everyone else does." And yes, it is indeed his presumption, presuming that Jesus is just like anyone else. Dear disciples of Christ. Can we not be like that too? Yes, I'm not talking about answering this particular question, but how many times in our lives we can make our responses thoughtlessly? How many yeses, how many noes in our responses to the questions, to the challenges, to the pressures of this world, without thinking it through, without seeking the Lord's will in His. In the Lord's word first, how easy it is that we can say yes to someone and to something simply because we want the peace and quiet of this world, without truly seeking to know the peace of Christ and a clear conscience. How often we can give in like that without thinking about the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can do that as parents, in the face of the beckoning calls and demands and questions of children, when saying yes is simply the way out, without having to go through at times the necessary, though difficult, to of godly discipline to the honor of Christ. We can do that in the workplace. We can do that among friends when saying yes gives us away from the mockery and the ridicule of being a follower of Jesus Christ. We can do that in certain areas of entertainment, recreation, and pleasure, which we know that in saying yes, Christ's name is blasphemed in those things. But the other side of The coin is that we don't get into those awkward moments with our friends and family members. Yes, on the surface, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Maybe it is a question from the world to tell us to tell a white lie or to cut corners, to watch a movie where God's name is blasphemed, to go to places, to go to web pages, to go to events where the Lord is completely dishonored, and we can thoughtlessly say yes to those things, presuming upon our own wisdom, our own strength, our own so-called faithfulness, without truly thinking that Christ's name and honor are. Being at stake, and Peter here is doing the exact same thing. Maybe he is so shocked by these people, just co- these tax collectors coming to him with this unexpected question, and he thinks that well, all he needs to do is just to say yes to get him out of a possibly difficult and challenging situation with those temple. Tax collectors, those authorities, without truly considering the true meaning and the implication of that thoughtless answer. Dear people of God, 
is that not a call to you and to me to think about our own daily walk and our own daily talk? Whether our words and our works bring glory to and honour to Christ, or are we simply thoughtlessly doing and saying things as if Christ is not important to us? Is that not a wake-up call to us? Are we thinking biblically? Not only during the time of worship on the Lord's Day, but every single moment of our everyday lives. Are we a presumptuous people or are we a people humbly seeking the will of God in our daily lives? And not only do we see the presumption of Peter, we see secondly the portrayal, the portrayal, second, our second point. Yes, my friends, even though Peter hasn't given much thought about the question and the situation, but someone else has. And that is the Lord Jesus. He knows exactly what Peter has been thinking and what he has not been thinking. And in the following verses, we shall see a portrayal of the Lord Jesus as to who he really is. Let us read verse 25 once again. Peter there, um, he said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs and taxes? From their sons or from strangers? My dear friends, the first thing that we should see is the Lord Jesus' omniscience. His all-knowingness. He is the all-wise, all-knowing Lord. And how amazing it is that before Peter comes back to his house, the Lord Jesus is already anticipating him. It is not like parents anticipating their children to come back from playing outside, or older children anticipating their parents to return home. Like, oh, I'm expecting them to come home by now. No, it is far beyond that for the Lord Jesus. For he knows exactly which moment what second Peter would return. And he knows exactly what question those tax, temple tax collectors have asked and what answer Peter has given in response. For the Lord Jesus is the one who knows every single thought of man, no matter how far they are, and no matter how private it is. Even those thoughts in the chambers of our hearts and of our minds. The Lord Jesus is the one who searches every thought of men and women, boys and girls. As one commentator puts it, he is a silent witness to our every conversation. Yes, even this morning, he is the one who knows our thoughts through and through. What is going on right now in our minds even this morning. And so in his omniscience, in his all-knowingness, the Lord Jesus asked Peter this searching question, asking Peter and in doing so also telling him that king, earthly kings don't collect taxes and customs from their sons and family members, only the subjects, only the citizens and the foreigners. And it is the same nowadays if we look at the Queen of England. She is not required to pay taxes. And the royal family uh, in London has this tax exemption simply because of who they are being family members of the royal household. And so do we see what the Lord Jesus is really asking here of Peter? He's asking him, he's saying to him, in your answer, yes, who do you say that I am? Am I simply a subject just like anyone else in, this, in Israel? A subject of the temple? And this is what the Lord Jesus is striking at here. The Lord Jesus is giving Peter a reminder, a portrayal of his divine sonship. And it is resting in this question of who should pay tribute to these rulers in the temple. He's saying to Peter, 
Should I pay that tribute? Or should they pay tribute to me? My friends, do we see how pointed this question is to Peter? Do we notice how the Lord Jesus, he is not saying, what do you think, Peter? No, but he said, what do you think, Simon? This is Peter's old name. And this is the very name that was mentioned in the region of Caesarea Philippi. When the Lord asked that very question, but who do you say that I am? And remember what Peter, by the grace of God, by the revelation of God the Father, said back in Matthew 16, verse 16. What what did he say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is what the Lord Jesus wants Peter to be reminded of. He is far beyond just a subject or even the best rabbi in Israel. He is indeed and truly the son of the living God, the son of the majesty on high. And so, do we see what the issue is here? Peter is slow of heart to put into practice what he has confessed and professed about Christ. He didn't think about the Lordship, the divine sonship of Christ, when he said yes to those temple tax collectors. Dear believers, is that not the the issue with us many a time? The failure to live out our profession and confession of Christ in our daily lives. Yes, we can be so tempted to simply confine our profession of faith to simply a statement we utter on the lips or when we go to the Lord's table without having the confession of Christ sinking into the core of our being. And to have that divine sonship and lordship of Christ being the guiding principle Of your and my daily living. In our daily words. And in our daily works. How easy it is to forget that. And I myself included. And how easy it is to simply fall back onto the old man. Our so called wisdom. Which is in the light of God's truth. Nothing but foolishness. Our self centeredness. Rather than Christ centeredness. How much you and I, dear disciples of Christ, need this daily renewal of our minds by the word of God, by the constant remembrance of who Christ is. And this is what the Lord is doing for Peter. And this is what the Lord is pleased to do for us, even this morning. And therefore do we see by faith this work of the omniscient Christ. And yes, the omniscience, the all-knowingness of the Lord Jesus, the truth about him knowing our every single thought, even the inmost thoughts that our closest loved ones on earth do not know. That truth can be so terrifying, for he is the Holy Son of God. However, this truth concerning the Lord Jesus of his omniscience can also be so very comforting. For he is the one who knows exactly what we need and whom we need. And is that not a reason to relinquish at his feet those thoughts of ourselves and to flee to him for help and for grace? Look at how the Lord Jesus responds to Peter's. Peter's inconsistencies and weakness of his faith. The Lord Jesus is not responding to Peter with fury and anger, but with that divine patience, with his long suffering, that gentle voice of grace to bring this child of God back. Don't we, dear flock of Christ, need a gentle voice of grace of the shepherd also? And not only do we see the portrayal of Christ in this question, we also see more of him regarding the payment, the payment which is our third point, the payment. My friends, at this point of our passage, we may expect the Lord Jesus would be saying to Peter, Well, Simon Peter, 
Now you got the answer. You should be going back to those temple tax collectors, saying that, "Well, I'm not going to pay the tax because I'm not subjected to it because I have the divine exemption as the Son of God." We may expect him saying that, but no, we don't hear any of that, as we can read in the first part of verse twenty-seven, as it says, "Nevertheless, lest we offend them." Yes, do we see what the Lord Jesus is saying here? He is willing to give this tribute, this temple tax, not out of any necessity or moral obligation, but out of his compassion and humility. Friends, what a glimpse of Christ once again! He who is the all-knowing, the divine Son of the Father, the one who is the true temple of God, the true tabernacle, the. Tr- The Emmanuel, he is willing to submit himself even to a temple ordinance. Why? All because he has great love and concern for sinners. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, here we behold the heart of Christ. Even though to him belongs all the divine rights. He does not want to have the insistence of, on his rights and privileges, to have them to become a stumbling block to others, to others to come to know him as the Messiah, as the only Savior of sinners. And what do I mean by that? The Lord Jesus does not want anyone to say or to give any excuse, saying something like. Well, you see this Jesus; he doesn't care about the temple and the worship of God. See, he refuses to pay the temple tax. He must be someone who loves to hoard money, and therefore, how can we pay attention to a rabbi like this? And so, do we see why the Lord Jesus would be willing to pay the temple tax? And yes, it is not the first time we see the Lord Jesus showing his disciples his humility, because if we think about it, his whole life on earth has been a life of humility. We can think of his incarnation, how he left, the splendor, the glory, the riches, the majesty of heaven, all of them behind, and to be born into a place of lowliness. And to live his infant years as a refugee in Egypt, and to spend the majority of his time in the backwaters of Israel to work as a humble carpenter, friends, he is the one by whom, for whom all things were created. Yet he would stoop so low. Yes, even at his baptism, to identify himself with sinners. To make himself of no reputation, and now we see him subjecting himself to pay this temple tax. Friends, do we behold him? He is indeed and truly the servant of the Lord. And dear believers, what about us? If our Lord and Master would forego his rights for the saving good of others, what about you? What about me? I know this is absolutely contrary to our modern thinking. A world that prizes human rights and freedoms to no end, more than、uh, the word of God, to say the very least. But the question that comes to us as professing Christian believers is this: How do you and I use our gospel freedoms, dear people of God? And how much we need to be reminded of those words in Galatians five verse thirteen. Galatians five thirteen. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Do we have that lowliness of mind, worked by the Holy Spirit, as a fruit, as a result of being? A child of God in Jesus Christ, my friends. Not only can we see the humility and the lowliness of the Lord Jesus in His willingness regarding the payment to the temple, we also see fourthly and finally the provision. The provision. 
And through this, we are to see that the, see the Lord's omnipotence, the one who is all powerful. And let us read uh, the following part of verse uh, 27. The following part the Lord says, Go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them. For me and you. Friends, how amazing are these words of the Lord Jesus. The humble servant of the Lord is speaking words of not only omniscient, but words of his omnipotent glory. He is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who is able to bring himself glory through ordinary means. Yes, the provision for the payment doesn't come from the money purse held by Judas Iscariot, but through fishing. And yes, this is not a suggestion, but the sovereign command given to Peter, this former fisherman. This word, this command, is not filled with perhaps or maybe saying to Peter, Well, Peter, try. Go fishing, maybe. Try to find a good spot that you know of in your past experiences. Put on good baits even. Let's hope and let's see if we can get something from there. No, not at all. This is a sovereign word of Christ with a sure promise. And and Peter is commanded to go forth in simple trust and obedience. And friends, how often does that happen? How often do, do we find a coin in, a, in the fish's mouth. Well I'm sure Peter. With all of his years of experience. In the fishing industry. Has never come across that. Has never seen that happen. Why? Because this is not a coincidence. It is not a guess. But a miracle of Christ. In his gracious provision. He is revealing to Peter. He is indeed and truly. The sovereign one. The one to whom. Uh, as even Psalm 95 verse 5 says. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Dear people of God, he is the one who can provide for all of our needs. Not only in time, but for eternity. Is that not a wonderful invitation to you and to me, dear troubled souls, to call upon him in whatever circumstance, in whatever difficulty, in whatever trial that we face, For he is the one who can guide us and provide for us. My dear friends, in this miracle, we see the riches of his grace. Because in the Greek, the coin that is in the fish's mouth is the Greek word stator. stator. And that is the exact amount of the temple tax for two. And this is why the Lord Jesus said, take that and give it to them for me and you. How amazing it is that the Lord Jesus is not only able to provide for himself, but indeed for Peter. But we see more than that. In the Lord's graciousness and his love, we see the Lord Jesus and Peter are bound up together. Even though the Lord Jesus doesn't have to. But he chose to. He chose to do that for this undeserving Peter. And what a wonderful picture it is of the Lord Jesus, of his love and of his grace, of what he would do for his bankrupt, sinful people. And indeed, the temple tax, I don't know if we noticed that, the temple tax according to Exodus chapter 30, Exodus 30, verse 12, this very tax was originally designated as the ransom money, the ransom tax. And yes, that is that is served as a reminder to the people of Israel, to sinners that they need to be ransomed, for we owe a debt that we cannot pay for ourselves. And other human beings, other mere creatures cannot pay for that either either for them or for us. 
Only the Lord Jesus can. And it is not with a coin or any gold or silver, but as later on Peter testified in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. My dear friends, how amazing is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is far greater than the temple in Jerusalem, far more glorious. But yet for the sake of sinners, he would give his life as a ransom for many. And Peter later on knows that he needs more than a coin from the fish's mouth. He needs more than the temple tax to be paid. He knows that in order to gain the free access into the presence of God, he needs the precious blood of Christ, a ransom price to be paid by the Lord himself. In order to be ransomed, in order to be forgiven, restored and healed, in order to be rescued from being children of wrath to free children of the heavenly king. Adopted in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, have we been ransomed by the blood of the Saviour? Have we come to know him savingly through repentance and faith? And do we know those words for me and you in the gospel? And is that our desire to live to Christ's honour and to live for the saving good of others? Humbly, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God, not just on the Lord's day, but every day of our lives as Him. Not as slaves, not as subjects, but as free children of the great King in Christ. Amen.